How do you make everything smart? Hello and welcome to Tech First. My name is John Goodseer. I've been talking about smart matter for like a decade now, and we're on the cusp of being able to make that happen at a much higher level than ever before. The idea is that everything can be smart. A window can be smart, a door, your shoes, your glasses or contacts. But what will it take to enable that? AI Zip thinks they have what's required. They make tiny AIs. We're not talking massive LLMs here like ChatGPT, very small, super small systems for shoes, earbuds, bicycles, even on chips and much more. To chat, we have the co-founder, Yubei Chen. Welcome, Yubei. Thank you, John. Let's start at the very beginning. Why should everything be smart? Well, that's a very interesting question. So I think it's um, um, AI essentially is uh, fundamentally, fundamentally changing the interface, how we interact with the uh, physical world. So wherever you have sensors, wherever you have an interface that can you can interact with, right? So AI can potentially make them more efficient, more reliable, or just the more convenient and natural. I think that that's really the ultimate goal to put AI in all of these classical devices, and that has been there for decades and cool. uh, reinvent them. Cool. Give me some examples of things that we don't typically think of as, hey, that should be smart or that should be intelligent, but it's better when it is. Yeah. So one interesting example could be that uh, for the uh, uh, recent project that we worked with uh, SoftBank, and that is a, a end of the water uh, smart camera that can help you identify all those fishes, right? So figure out when they're hungry, right? So and then you can feed them at the right time. And, uh, you know, that has been a, a classical industry uh, there for decades, right? So without introducing AI into that. But recently, the fish food price has surged by three times. And uh, that actually got a lot of the fish farmers out of business. And so by using the AI into this classical and traditional industry, you can really generate a lot of those value. Another example is that uh, if you think about that, uh, many years ago, there was a Google Glass. Right, mm -hmm. so where you deliver the sound to the, the bone, right? So and uh, and you can reverse that process if you think about uh, you know how do you actually ultimately denoise, remove any of the noise in the physical world, right? So and and you can when you talk, right? So let's say there's a very noisy background, you can use that bone to transmit all those sound into the sensor, and then you can use that sensor as a microphone. So that is a very interesting application, and that's a project we did with uh, Borsch. Mm -hmm. and to use the bone conduction sensor to uh, turn that into a smart microphone. Interesting. You also put, I believe, some AI in shoes, correct? Yeah. So that, that is a, uh, that's, it's a extremely small AI model. So that's a time series AI model. Essentially use the times and, you know, basically IMU sensors, right? So generate the waveforms and then you can, uh, understand this waveform and then identify whether the person uh, walking, jogging, standing, sitting, you know, different uh, 13 different categories of behavior. And then um, it turns out you can actually build a neural network that is only eight kilobytes. And Whoa. Is, yes, it's a uh, eight kilobytes neural networks. And, you know, rather than not even a few hundred kilobytes, right? So 8,000 parameters and you can do reliable human activity detection. That is crazy. Okay, cool. So we're going to get into all this stuff. We're going to talk about how you build your AI models, how you build your AI systems, how you fit them into eight kilobytes, all that stuff. We'll talk about the hardware that's necessary, software, that sort of thing. And we'll talk about maybe some of the potential downsides. Does this make things more vulnerable to hacking? Does it make things more expensive? Does it make our world more fragile? Do things break down more often if we make them all smart? Before we get there, you're focusing on edge AI as opposed to AI in the cloud. And we're pretty used to AI in the cloud, right? I mean, ChatGPT is in the cloud, Cloud is in the cloud, Google's Gemini is in the cloud. Apple, of course, has done some AI in the cloud and some AI on device, right? And they've got chips that are built specifically built for that reason. You're fully in on edge, how come? So that's a very, has a little bit of philosophical point, you know, in this question, I love that. And if you think about the history, when uh, the first computer came out, like ENIAC, right? So that, that was uh, really huge, right? So, and then there was a famous saying that the world needs only five, uh, has a market for five computers. And now if you ask the same question again, how many uh, computers do we need? 
in the world, right? So we ha- each of us have um, plenty, right? So our mm-hmm. smartwatch, the phones, you know, microcontrollers here and there. Yeah, exactly. So the question is that now for all the, the AI system, when they came out, it, it would be clunky, right? So very big and only a few in the world, right? So super powerful and super power hungry also. But then the question is that ultimately, how many AI models do each of us need, right? So how many of these AI models do we will, will we eventually buy? And our answer is that uh, we believe that there would be a few very big AI models, just like in big computers, right? So, but there would be also plenty of these small models and that uh, is going everywhere, right? So that's mm-hmm. really what we see as the future. I like that. I mean, I can imagine one that is running my uh, house HVAC system and it's understanding what the temperature is, where, whether there's going to be a lot of cloud uh, or a lot of sun or rain or snow or whatever the case might be. What will I do with the temperatures? And I don't currently have solar panels, but I anticipate having them at some point in the future. How much energy will I get from there? Those sorts of things. I anticipate having them for my windows. Should I close the shades? Should I keep the shades open? Maybe the doors. Should I be locked? Should I be not locked? Who's in? Are there trusted people in or they're untrusted people outside those sorts of things so i can see lots of use cases for small embedded models scattered throughout thousands of locations potentially in a home and maybe millions in a warehouse or a manufacturing center or something like that okay cool so that's edge ai talk a little bit about how you build these things and maybe let's start with the software i mean we're used to more and more and more parameters you talked about the big LLMs, you talked about the power hungry LLMs and and every couple of months, it seems, especially over the past 18 months, maybe a little less into the future, it's been, you know, now we have 500 billion parameters. Now we have 800 billion parameters. Now we have a trillion parameters, you know, and we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. We take longer and longer to train more and more data, more and more power hungry. Obviously you must be going in a different direction. Definitely. So I believe that efficiency is also going to be a, a big topic for, for the cloud models also. If you think about, uh, the, the, the AI efficiency right now, what are uh, these cloud models are doing is basically pack the, all the, all of the human knowledge into a single model. It's right? mm-hmm. a whole internet of data, right? So that every one and a half years are, uh, unique training tokens increase by another 10x, right? So if you actually plot the, the past a few years, you see that sort of see that tra- trajectory. That's a new AI modern, uh, uh, Morse law, and that's a scaling law. So the models will also become larger and larger. But so the question is that a lot of the times, given the context, local context, a lot of these knowledge would be relatively useless. So that's why, uh, you will see a, a huge opportunity by using all these MOE models, the recent deep seek models, right? So, and you, you can save, right? So the, you know, you really don't, do not need a, all of the ROM history in order to, to put AI voice recognition into your, you know, let's say TV controller, right? So mm-hmm. that's, uh, you know, mm-hmm. the context is just going to be irrelevant majority of the time. And the question is that how do you actually build those AM models that is efficient, but in the meantime, also robust, mm-hmm. right? Because one of the biggest the promise for all of these big models is that, that they are not programmed, but instead they are trained. Mm-hmm. All these properties are emergent, mm-hmm. right? So, and when you have all these uh, scalable data, and you really have these models start to have emergent, uh, you know, uh, intelligence and generalization. And the question is that can you actually use much less data, build much smaller models, and so that you have sufficient generalization for this particular domain, but not more, right? So robustness asks for more and efficiency asks for less. Going to marry this two very difficult to marry things together. It's pretty interesting, right? Because my shoes don't need to know about politics in ancient Rome. Right. They, they, they never need to care about that or know about that, but they need to know about, you know, impact. They need to know about cadence. They need to know about, you know, steadiness. Uh, are my steps steady or unsteady? Am I maybe experiencing some challenges or health issues or something like that? All those sorts of things. But they, it's a narrow, narrow domain. So that makes tons of sense. You make tons of sense. You're making it super efficient as small as eight kilobytes, which is unfreaking believable. What about the hardware? Uh, you've talked about, uh, I've seen some of your, your tech is running on a chip. So maybe it's just on existing hardware. But last I checked, my shoes didn't have a chip embedded in them. What kind of hardware do you need to put in there? And I'm, there's a whole subsystem here, right? Because there's some kind of memory. There's some kind of compute. 
there's some kind of power, right? And there's some kind of sensors. What's that look like? Definitely. So essentially, we work. Um, we have been here for uh, four and a half years, right? And we already start to establish a lot of the uh, uh, partnership and customers. Essentially, a lot of these um, hardware companies and are already our partners, very close partners. So we're talking about ARM, Qualcomm, Renesas, analog devices, ST Micro, Infineon, Microchips. All these. Um, uh, hardwares who are building efficient uh, processors, whether that that's IC, you know, silicon chips, or sensors like Voyage, and our IP like Cadence, you know, they're generating these um, the IPs and ARMs is IP, and so that essentially we build AI models that fits their hardware, and then uh, together with these uh, very important hardware partners, we're going to bring this experience to the next gen devices. And you're right, right? So a lot of times we do not already have the sensor there, right? But really for the next gen um, devices, you know, you can really think about a lot of these sensors that do not even need a big battery mm -hmm. and even mm -hmm. do energy harvesting all the way to your mobile phones and smart PC, right? So that's a range we cover. Essentially yeah. anything in between, we will be the right one to, to put AI models on those different platforms. Super interesting. So I assume that people are building things that pretty much integrate things on a simple, a single chip or a single little piece of hardware that incorporates everything that we just talked about, including some level of communication. So some kind of radio, whether that's Bluetooth or something like that. And I have seen even years ago, you've got some chips that are so tiny, they do harvest radio waves for energy. Uh, they don't have to have a battery. Obviously, if it's in a shoe or an article of clothing, it could use some sort of piezoelectric kind of component to generate power if it needed to, those sorts of things. Okay, cool. Cool hardware, cool software. There are some potential downsides, right? Like, and I always wonder about this on cars. Um, so, so cars have, cars are rolling computers these days, right? And a million sensors on them, a million is too much. It's not too, not a million, but you get my point. Lots of cameras, all that other stuff. And, and sometimes that means that hey, it's crazy expensive to fix and more things can go wrong and more things do go wrong. On the other hand, you have to balance that with, you know, I got warned and so I didn't back into this person behind me, literally coming out of the gym, the little red came on on the side of the screen and I didn't back in, I didn't kill somebody today. So that's, that's a positive. Also, I probably have fewer crashes because I've been warned, hey, there's a car stop there, or those sorts of things, right? Talk about how these systems impact product quality, longevity, those sorts of things. Yeah, definitely. So essentially, you know, one big question is that uh, if you walk around in the real world, right? So you can, you keep wondering so how could that AI is not penetrating in all of these uh, different devices and sensors? A lot of the times the question comes to the robustness, right? So can you actually build these AI models that are super efficient and not a demo, but also super robust in real world? Mm -hmm. Right. So again, right. So that's a very, uh, that's a key challenge for the cars. A lot of the times you have to actually put these AI functions there, but they also have to work very, very robustly. And, um, but if you can actually do that, and that's generating a lot of those values, as you mentioned, that there are different uh, detections, right? So a lot of these detection systems, they can just make your driving a little bit more safe, a little bit safer, I would say. Right. So, and also make the interaction with your car a lot more natural. The other day I was driving my Tesla and I was trying to turn on the valet mode. And then it, it took me, I, I really need to take out my phone and search for that uh, valet mode. Right. So Chat GPT, how do I turn on valet mode in my car? Exactly. Exactly. So if you have the small language model, local agent, audio AI agent in your car, on your device, right? So essentially you can turn all of these menus self-contained. Did you so, try and press the button on your steering wheel and say, Tesla, turn on a valet mode? I, I didn't. I did. I, I just, uh, I just <laughs> went there. Sometimes our I, devices are smarter than we are. So another thing is that the audio AI intelligence really have a huge potential you know, all of these devices, right? So provide a very natural interface. That's one thing, right? So you can use voice to interact with all this physical world. And, but also 
um, if you truly understand what is the sound, right? So different channels of the sound, you can understand where there is noise, where there's speech, where there's not your speech, right? So, and then you're going to have personalized denoising. But also you can turn any of this earbud, smart earbud into a hearing aid mm -hmm. by just uh, amplifying all the useful voices and remove all those noises, right? So, and it can really make a huge value. Cool. Cool. Well, super interesting, super cool stuff. I assume it makes stuff more expensive. No, that's a really, you know, there are two things you should ask, right? So when you are talking about efficient AI is that how, what's the cost and how reliable they are, right? So if you can, you know, we are, we are building some of these world's smallest uh, audio perception models, right? So, mm -hmm. and smallest uh, language models, production quality. And essentially you can put these audio perception models, basic voice perception onto the chips that cost less than 10 cents US dollars. Which basically make those models uh, easily tossable. Uh, Even you know, with you tariffs, that's under a dollar. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can put um, you know a lot of the tax onto that and still be under a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> you got to try hard. And then um, another thing is that you can put all these um, very capable audio AI agents onto the chip that costs less than 10 bucks US dollars, right? So essentially now you can really afford to put these language models into essentially anything that has a menu. Let's say that's a TV, you can put a language model there, a car, language model there, printer, there, language model there. Mm -hmm. Whatever you find that you need a better and more natural interface. A language model for the printer. Wow, that would be amazing. The little the screen on my printer is like a postage stamp right here. And the the the, the UI is was invented by sadists. I'm I'm convinced of it. Being able to talk to my printer and just tell it what to do, if it would actually do it, that would be amazing. Yeah, anything, you know, these menus has been there forever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, and when the devices become more and more sophisticated and capable, the menu is just getting longer and longer, right? Mm -hmm. So, and even mm -hmm. the artist, the baby monitoring camera has a very large menu. And, uh, <laughs> you, you know, and then that really- That would be an it. interesting case for a model that understands baby, understands how babies cry. You know, if something is gonna go down, if it's maybe urgent, those sorts of things. And I'm sure we could learn that over time. Very, very cool stuff. Yeah, so for baby monitoring, we are also, uh, providing a lot of these uh, baby crying detection, sound audio event detection models that can really go into every, those baby monitoring camera provide a very reliable perception. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but also when the f baby face is covered and when the baby is not in sleeping in the right position pose mm -hmm. and uh, are, mm -hmm. you know, could be uh, glass breaking, right? So all these uh, smart home um, um, protection systems, right? So you want to have a more reliable glass breaking uh, a detection. Mm -hmm. uh, I have my own home, uh, a smart home uh, system, and uh, you know we we did some tests, right? So for some you know glass breaking, so fifty percent of the time it missed the 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 sound. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so you know you really want to make these models more reliable so that you can. You know what you need some models for? You need some models for smart home devices. So you don't have to like go on some funky, weird, private little Wi-Fi network and then tell it some Wi-Fi information that you don't really remember and you got to search up somewhere and then finally get it on and then it doesn't work. You got to try it again. That would be amazing. Just tell it, hey, here's the Wi-Fi network. Here's the password. Connect. That would be incredible. Uh, Yube, this has been interesting. This has been uh, productive. I appreciate your time. Cool stuff. I look forward to seeing uh, how it develops. Yeah, thank you so much for, you know, it's really a pleasure to chat today.